Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today we said goodbye to booster number 1046. Its life began with a bangabandu and ended with a bang as it carried the Dragon 2 capsule for the spectacular in-flight abort test. Booster 1046 was the first of the Block 5s. It was also the first uh, SpaceX rocket to launch from all three of their launch facilities. But really, we are interested in how that in-flight abort went. Well, initially there were a lot of delays for weather. The whole of Saturday was scrubbed, but on Sunday, after two and a half hours in the launch window, the vehicle lifted off and began to accelerate skywards, carrying its cargo to its fate. Apparently they weren't 100% sure exactly when the abort would be triggered, but uh, when it did, it was moving around 1700, 1800 kilometers per hour, maybe 17 kilometers up. And Elon explained in the post-flight press conference that the procedure was that the capsule would be deciding that the abort needed to happen. It would send the signal to the rocket to shut down its engines. Also, while pressurizing the tanks on the Super Draco thrusters, then it would fly away to safety. And of course, once that happened, the rocket was no longer guided. It had no control and it began to turn into the airstream and disintegrated. And out of that massive conflagration, we can also see some pieces of debris that continue. The, there is actually the second stage, which pretty much left that fireball intact. Back on the Dragon, it's now flying away with the trunk attached. And if you look down, you can see the cloud uh, that was left by the exploding booster. According to Elon at the post-flight press conference, the vehicle accelerated up to a speed of Mach 2.2. And the peak altitude that the capsule achieved was about 40 kilometers. So it keeps the trunk attached because it needs those fins for aerodynamic stability. But once it gets to the top, it needs to, of course, flip around and present the heat shield forward. So it has to dr drop the trunk. And so we see it falling away. What a beautiful shot that was there. So the capsule now has to for, uh, reorient, fall down. And we started to get some imagery from the WB-57 aircraft which were in the area. These are high altitude research vehicles. They're originally based on a British bomber design. The, the idea was they would fly above anything that could intercept them. But uh, that made them actually perfect for turning into high altitude reconnaissance vehicles. So we got this great footage of the capsule coming down. This is while the capsules are still above the aircraft. But eventually they drop below the aircraft and we get to see the uh, drogue chute deployment. So the chute deployment works where you have, first of all, a pair of drogue chutes that come out to stabilize the vehicle. And you can hear the crowd going wild back at SpaceX HQ. And then about 30 seconds later, we get the full parachute deployment. Of course, these deploy in a fashion where they unfurl slowly so that they uh, you know, reduce the force on it initially, ramp it up to allow the spacecraft and the crew to not be stressed too much. I believe Jim Bridenstine said that the vehicle never exceeded more than three and a half Gs. Also, it's worth noting that all four of these parachutes have slightly different patterns on them and that's important you know if you've got images or if you recover you want to figure out which one is which if there's say a something that results in the loss of the vehicle or whatever obviously in this case they had telemetry all the way down they did lose telemetry from the booster right away but I've heard from sources who say that they might have had some telemetry from the second stage of the rocket we'll talk about that later and so the Dragon touched down in the water about nine minutes after launch. And of course they had a team ready to go and recover it as quickly as possible in case there was any problems. But you know, normally you wouldn't have a team that close to the landing because you know you didn't know exactly how far down range an abort would happen. You wouldn't be expecting an abort. But the US military, the Air Force does have a team that specializes in recovery. And the capsules are designed to remain floating for at least 24 hours. That's the requirement. Obviously they can float probably a lot longer than that but 24 hours was the minimum requirement the you know if they happened to land in the middle of the ocean a u.s military rescue team would go in they would meet them they would 
give them rafts, and then they would hang out until a surface recovery vehicle could actually reach them. As it stands, the Dragon was pretty stripped down for this test. It was missing the screen. They had very simple dummies, you know, anthropomorphic test devices that weren't instrumented, but the seats were so that they could measure all the accelerations. And they had some cargo on board to make sure it didn't move around too much. Probably the best video of the abort came from SpaceX. They posted this to their Twitter about a couple of hours after the event. Of course, you know, portrait video is a crime against humanity, so I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. You can see a few extra details here. First thing is that when the Drake was light, look for the orange cloud of oxidizer that comes out first. And then after this leaves, just above the interstage, you'll see that they start dumping some sort of gas. I think they're depressurizing tanks, like they're safing the rocket, and that's the trail of uh, gas that we're seeing after the engines have shut down. I mean, I think tank venting is probably a standard part of the shutdown process in an emergency, but I'm going to think at this point, the vehicle is going forwards and is now being decelerated. So the forces on the tank should actually be inverted. The fuel and the oxidizer should be piling towards the front of the tank and the venting won't occur in the same manner. Elsewhere, there's a lot of unofficial footage. A lot of people came from all over the US to just you know image this take pictures, it was going to be a very unique event, and people brought very special gear. So Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, has this big telescope, which is connected to a computer and a, an X-52 joystick, which is what I usually use to fly in Elite Dangerous. He hoped to get some amazing views of this rocket exploding in slow motion. This is what he got. Shots here. Here we go, it's going to happen right now too. It's gonna happen right now in the clouds! No! I can't see it. Lost in the clouds! No! No! But some people did get lucky and they found a gap in the clouds from their vantage point, whereas other people, like Kerbal Space Academy, they made their own luck by going to see. So I think most of the useful footage for analysis comes from the official stream. So this is the sequence, it's playing at one quarter speed here, and first thing you might have noticed was that the engines on, the Draco engines, were firing before the combustion on the main engines properly stopped. You know, there's still fuel in those lines, and it takes a fraction of a second for those to depressurize, and then after that they continue to burn. Now you can make out the shape of the launch vehicle here, there's the two black bands on it, one for the bottom of the rocket and one which is the interstage between the, the, the first and the second. So keep an eye on those. You can see the booster is starting to turn edge on into the stream. This is going, of course, more than one and a half times the speed of sound. It is no longer controlled and the aerodynamic forces are enough to tear that booster apart and spread the RP-1 and liquid oxygen out where they combust. Now, if you look over on the left, you can actually see the second stage flying away. How do we know that's the second stage? We actually get good photographs of it later. As far as we can tell, that second stage is still fully loaded with RP-1 and liquid oxygen. It tumbles for a little, but it seems to find its orientation, and of course, we'll get to see this later. Once again, even slower, literally, it just turns into a giant fireball very quickly, but they didn't activate the flight termination system. So Jack Bear was on the ground with some big cameras, and he got some great photos, and most importantly, he got photos of the piece of debris that flew off, uh, that fell all the way down and made a big hole in the ocean, a big cloud. And yeah, in an image, it pretty much looks like a cylinder which is white at one end and black at the other end. This is the second stage. It was fully loaded with liquid oxygen and RP-1. They didn't load it with water, incidentally, because otherwise you would have had to change out the plumbing and it's a lot easier to just load with the hardware you already have. Also, if you compare it to an image from earlier in the stream, it does look like there's a little bit extra below that interstage, so we've probably got 
the top part of the oxygen tank, that's where it broke. That's where the rocket broke, splitting open the oxygen tank and the aerodynamic pressure probably just peeled that tank apart, allowed the RP-1 to leak out, they mixed together, there was a hot spot and we got that awesome fireball. But also that second stage was intact all the way down. So if they'd activated the flight termination system, that would not have been seen falling because that would have been unzipped by the flight termination system. We know it was fully fueled because when it hit the ocean, John Krause captured an image showing a fireball, showing that it still had fuel and oxidizer on board. This would have probably massed about 100 tonnes and was moving maybe about the speed of sound when it hit the ocean. In fact, David Hash, who had been photographing it in infrared, was able to image shockwaves as this thing descended through the atmosphere. And I want to leave you with one final representation of how energetic this event was. It was visible to the GOES East weather satellite. It showed up in the lightning detector. It's kind of amazing how this stands out as a bright spot over the entire Florida region. So thanks to the booster's noble sacrifice, we know that the astronauts will indeed be safe in a worst case scenario. We can look forward to DM2, which they're now talking about potentially extending it from being a simple two-week mission to a much longer duration mission. Uh, we'll see how that goes. That will happen at the earliest in quarter two of this year. The hardware is supposed to be on site for the end of Q1 and... You obviously, they have to close out all the reports, get all their approvals, and then decide on their mission. So hopefully uh, by spring, we'll be seeing U.S. astronauts flying on this. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.